Hello and welcome. My name is Casey Butler and I am the Director of Communications here at Crossroads Christian Church in Corona. One of the things that we talk quite a bit about around here is our DNA. It's something that we know that God has called each person to, but also that He's designed specifically for each church. And that's something that we should never veer from. It's something that never changes because it's the exact and specific calling God has for each one of us to make us who we are. And today, Pastor Chuck and I are shooting a video for Hope University, and we're going to be exploring the calling that God has on this church at Crossroads and where it all stems from. And DNA is huge. I think one of the things that people very often forget is that God has created us individually to be who we are, and we should celebrate that. And then what happens very often is we find churches, and a church is created with the specific DNA by God to fulfill its part in the body of Christ. And we're able to understand that and celebrate it. It helps us to be far, far more effective. Uh, to help people understand that better, it, it's kind of like uh, how we function individually. So when you and I as individuals understand that, like for instance, you might be created to be an extrovert and I may be an introvert or vice versa, then we need to be able to function in that role. Um, an example of that even is the fact that um, there's what's called the Myers-Briggs temperament sorter or the Kersey Bates temperament sorter. And those help analyze your personality. And so Pam and I are actually complete opposites. I'm an NT, which means I'm intuitive and thinking. Pam is an SP, which means she's sensing and perceptive. And whenever I try to force Pam to be me, it always creates problems in our marriage. Whenever she wants me to be her, it does. Uh, another way of looking at mine, an NT is a very perfectionist person. So I like to make lists and check them off. I think you do too. I do. Yep. And uh, Pam doesn't. She's more of a free spirit. So when I try to force her to be something she is, then it creates problems in our relationship. I uh, joke with her a lot that um, an NT tends to be very effective and do well in organizations. An SP, actually is disproportionately high in being found in prisons <laughs> and being actually people get more arrested who have that personality so i always tell pam that i'm a person of conviction and she's a person of many convictions so uh, but here's the thing let's say that you're getting ready to get married and i was going to do your premarital counseling and i want to help you have a great marriage what i'm going to do is i want to know your family background i want to know your personal history i want to know your personality and i want to know your strengths and weaknesses and i want to know that of the person you're marrying um, in a church we want to know the church's family background we want to know its personal history we want to know the personality of that church and, and we also want to be able to guide them based on their strengths and weaknesses so this ends up being a bigger deal than people think about feeding our effectiveness you know, and so we need to understand, for instance, that Crossroads and a lot of our churches have a pretty amazing DNA that comes from our family background. Well, up until recently, I didn't realize that we at Crossroads were actually part of a particular movement. So I've always thought that Crossroads was called a non-denominational church. Is that still accurate to say? Well, yes and no. I mean, first of all, we are non-denominational when you ask the question, do we have a governing body outside of our autonomous churches that we answer to? So the truth is we're not non-denominational uh, as far as affiliation because we have an affiliation of churches, but we don't have a governing institution. So we are non-denominational, but we are so a part, also are a part of a group of churches that is gathered together, that is partnered together, that works on the same criteria. And so I love the particular movement we're a part of. Well, I was surprised also to find out that we are actually ranked as the number two fastest growing religious movement of the 90s, and that's according to the New York Times. Uh, but then in 2002, the St. Louis Dispatch actually ranked us number one for growth and the eighth largest body out of 149 other movements. Yeah, and I think that's kind of interesting. A lot of people aren't even sure who we are, but we are one of the largest groups in the United States as far as religious movement, and we are the fastest producer of megachurches of any movement. So God is blessing what we're doing and blessing who we are. And, uh, you know, I think it's because we're more into unity than we are into competitiveness. You don't hear about that much. But I think we can celebrate the fact we're a part of a group that God is using in a big way to reach a lot of people. Right. Well, I know that we're part of this uh, movement. What are some other churches that are also a part of this? Well, you know, um, it's kind of fun. The largest church in the state of Idaho, Real Life Christian Fellowship, is a part of our church, or a part of our movement. Um, Judd Will Heights at a church in Las Vegas called Central Christian Church, the largest church in the state of Nevada. They're a part of our movement. Um, 
Another one would be Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky. And depending on how it's counted, they're either one of the largest or maybe the top three largest churches in the United States. Now, it's not just about size, but I think it's important to know that we are seeing our churches grow and be effective. And so the churches we're attached to are doing some pretty great things. Wow. Well, uh, don't you guys usually put on the NACC as well? Yeah, one of the things we do is we gather together once a year at the North American Christian Convention, which is a preaching and teaching convention. And uh, so we gather together, we share God's word, we do iron sharpens iron, we encourage each other. And, and so it's one of the places we come together. And don't you usually invite speakers who aren't particularly a part of our movement? Yeah, if you ever went to the NACC, you might see, for instance, Rick Warren speaking there. You might see Jim Cimbala speaking there, Erwin McManus. All are strong Christian leaders that we love and respect and cherish, but they're not a part of the churches we're a part of. That doesn't mean we see them as different, but that's the whole idea of who we are. We believe the unity of the body is more important than the names of the body. Something that seems to come up quite a bit is the question of why there's so much division in the church. I mean, we have the Nazarenes, the Methodists, the Lutherans, the Catholics. Yeah, and you think about Baptists alone. I mean, you have American Baptists, Southern Baptists, Free Will Baptists, Independent Baptists. And I'm not knocking the Baptists. The Baptists were a huge part of my coming to know Christ. And we're not even saying any of the other groups in and of itself is wrong. But a lot of people right now are asking the question, if Jesus called for one church, why does there seem to be so much division? And in the 1800s, there was a group of pastors that got together and said it shouldn't be that way. In John chapter 17, right before Jesus died, one of the things he did is he prayed, God, I pray that they all would be one, even as you and I are one. That goes to the very heart of God. It goes to the very thing that Jesus wanted. And so what I want us to think about is what those pastors thought about. How can we come together? How can we have unity? How can we get along? And for us, it's not about the fact we can't be called by different names. You know, just like, you know, a, a family might have different children with different names and they're right. still one family. We can have that, but we still could have unity. So what they came up with was something very interesting, was a motto. Where the Bible speaks, we speak. And where the Bible's silent, we're silent. Hmm. And so what happened is we said, if we came to an agreement that the Bible was our sole source of authority, and that's how we lived out our lives, that's how our churches were run, that's how our theology was set, then we could have the unity that God wants us to have. Um, that's one of the things that we need to hold on to. So in our particular group of churches, we live our lives based on God's word. Psalm 19, seven says, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So we can trust in God's word to give us wisdom, to give us direction, to help us in our lives. We, as a group of churches, have heeded the, key, the, the call of God to preach God's word. So we take very seriously what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 to 4, where it says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, resort, uh, and exhort with great patience and instruction, for the time will come where they'll not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn their ears from the truth and turn aside to myths. So why that's important is whenever you go to one of our churches, you're going to notice that our source of authority is scripture and the preaching that comes is from God's word, based on God's word, trusting in God's word. Mm -hmm. Now, this is something else that becomes huge. We believe and know based on our history and based on what's going on today, that the word of God is what's most effective. That's what people are hungry for. That's what people go to churches for is to hear what God has to say. And the only way we'll find that's in the Bible, again, which is our sole source of authority. And whenever that word is unleashed, it becomes active, alive, and exciting. In Hebrews 4.12, it says the word of God is active, alive, and sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide between the marrow and the, and the bones. It's able to reach to the deepest part of who we are. And so when someone comes to one of the churches that are our churches and the word of God is preached correctly, it goes to the deepest part of what we need and what we need to know. And so we trust in that. And then we are also able to trust that God's word never, ever returns void. In Isaiah 55, uh, verse 11, the Lord says that God's word goes out and it will never, ever return without creating the effect that he wants it to. So when you go to one of our churches, you find that it's in our DNA to speak where the Bible speaks. And that, I believe, is part of the reason that Crossroads has been so effective these last five years. Uh, we have more than doubled in attendance. Uh, we've seen thousands of people come to know Christ. We've reached multi-generations. We've become very diverse. And because God's word goes across all of that and brings people to him, Jesus said that when he's lifted up, he'll draw all men unto him. And so when we're preaching his word, we're holding to his word, we're believing that is our sole source of authority, 
then that's when we find ourselves being effective and blessed by God. Hmm. Well, one of the things that I love about Crossroads, and I know that you feel the same way, is that we veer as far away from legalism as possible. Uh, that's just not in our DNA to be legalistic. And one area that I know personally for this to be true is in our area of worship. Uh, I love that we don't have to stick to a particular style of worship. Well, and I think you're right, because that motto was where the Bible speaks, we speak, and where the Bible is silent, we're silent. And that means we're not going to put in man-made rules. We're not going to hold their tradition or legalism. And when we are doing our best, when our churches are in their purest form, we don't do that. So, uh, you know, for instance, in the book of Revelations, it actually warns in Revelation 22 that we're not to add to or take away from the prophecy that's given there. Now, while that specifically applies to the book of Revelation, it also specifically or, or overarchingly applies to all scripture. We should not add to God's word or think we can find holiness apart from God's word. So, like worship, we're not going to worship a man-made form of worship. We're going to worship God. And so we know that styles come and go when we're free to enact those. And by the way, the Bible even says to sing to the Lord a new song. And so I think one of the things I love about our church is our worship is really relevant. It's exciting. Uh, it, it's passionate. It's something we can all relate to. But it isn't for us. It's so we can relate to it so we can grow closer and closer to God. Right. Another area that I, I recently saw this to be true is in the area of a dress code. I recently went to one of our elders retreats and got to sit through that and hear our elders hearts and I just loved hearing that we will never at Crossroads go to a dress code. And, uh, and it just makes me feel great because I know that I always try to dress as modestly as possible, but I also know that if I want to bring one of my friends to church, I don't have to worry that they're going to not feel welcome because of the way that they're dressed. Well, and I think that is huge. And as a matter of fact, in Mark 7, verse 13, Jesus made a warning. He said, we can invalidate the word of God with traditions of men. Hmm. And you know, it's interesting that dress is one of those traditions. And I've watched churches hold on to that and it literally wrecks and squeezes the life out of them. Hmm. Um, in the 1970s, when I first became a Christian, there was uh, two churches that I actually loved. And I love these churches. But what happened in the 70s is the Jesus people era had started. And there were all these guys with long beards, you know, and long hair and coming in at bare feet. And churches started excluding them. Uh, there were actually girls that were dressing in a way that the churches didn't like. And so one particular church that I know actually came up with a dress code that every girl who entered had to either wear a skirt or a dress or they weren't welcome. Wow. That church today is not in existence. Hmm. Uh, another church not far from there was a church that actually opened their doors and said, just come. Hmm. Uh, barefooted guys came, long bearded guys came. By the way, I was one of them. And uh, girls came, uh, <laughs> kind of funny. Uh, they were very hairy girls because a lot of men didn't shave their armpits. And so when they lifted their hands to worship, it was um, distracting. <laughs> but the thing about it is that church has exploded and been multiplying and God has been hmm. using them. And that's Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. Wow. And so, you know, one church held to a man-made tradition and died and another one opened their eyes and said, you know what, it's not about that. You know, mm. God doesn't look at the outward appearance, he looks at the heart. Right. Now there is a need for modesty, but Crossroads itself is a church that years and years ago took a stand against having a dress code. Mm. We had a young pastor named Tim Coop, and there was a lot of people pressuring Tim to say that girls couldn't wear a particular form of pants called dittos to our church. <laughs> they were very tight spinning pants. By the way, no one knows what they are today, and I'm praying that style never comes back, <laughs> and I don't want it to. Uh, girls wore halter tops back. And Tim refused to ever have a dress code. Mm. And because of that, I remember me and my friends, we all flocked to the church. And it wasn't for the dress code. It was for the acceptance. Mm. It was the idea we didn't have to change who we were to show up and hear about the gospel of Christ. We didn't have a man-made tradition block us. Mm. So when we take to heart that whole idea of where the Bible speaks, we speak. And where the Bible's silent, we keep silent. Well, you know what? God blesses that. Mm. He really does. And that's a cool part, a wonderful part of our DNA. And our elders actually at the retreat we were at, they literally put a mark of approval and said, we're never going to vary from this. Well, I know one other way that I was thinking of before we did this today uh, is the area of having a very balanced view when drinking alcohol. Uh, I know that that has hurt many people, but uh, again, we have a ba balanced view on it and we have to be careful that we don't put a man-made tradition there as well. Well, yeah, and that is another one of those because um, the reality is it's easy for churches to be swayed by the area they live in. Uh, for instance, in Europe, you know, drinking's not that big a deal amongst the churches. The United States, uh, you know, and maybe rightly so to a point, we need to be very careful because we don't want someone being addicted to something that would hurt them. The Bible's clear we're not to be addicted to anything. 
But the reality is, you know, that a lot of people in their tradition drink wine. Should they be excluded from church? Mm. Uh, should they have to hide the fact they right. do it? Um, and we don't believe that's a very good thing. We need to be able to be transparent. And so, you know, our leadership in particular here has said, you know, that's not an area we're going to get into. Now, we're going to help anybody who ever falls in this area, but we're never going to try to dictate someone's personal life with a man-made tradition or our view of what would create holiness. And so I think you've noticed the freedom in our church when it comes to that and a lot of other areas. Definitely. But I think it's true to say that not every church would agree with what you just said. And that's probably the beauty of it all, because some of my best friends would not agree with some of the things I just said, at least in application. Hmm. And uh, I would say a lot of other churches would disagree, but that's what makes us uh, go back to what we started with almost in the beginning, that the unity that we have is at the heart of the Lord. Hmm. And so Augustine said something that I think we all want to hold on to. He said, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, love. Hmm. And so whether we agree on drinking or any of those other things, the big, big deal, I think, is that we know what the essentials are and in the non-essentials we can disagree and love each other anyway. And I think what you're also saying is that it would be horrible if we were all alike. And uh, one thing that I love is hearing the statement that we are only Christians but we're not the only Christians. And we embrace others' opinions and we embrace other differences and we are a very diverse church. Well, and I think that's the big deal about why in our church in particular can be very diverse. I mean, we are a church of many different generations. As a matter of fact, four generations come in our church with unity and love and celebrate each other. And I think this makes us a little bit unique even of churches I know. But we can appreciate generational differences, racial differences, uh, uh, political differences. I mean, you see all that out there. And so, you know, the fact that we're able to literally embrace people of diversity and be a church of diversity makes us better. And uh, I agree, I wouldn't want to be a church where we're all looking alike, all thinking alike, all acting alike. Which speaks to the fact that our movement and being united was a church of intel, a movement of intelligence, and we want our churches to be. Uh, in the 1800s, the whole movement began by having debates, not for the purpose of dividing, but for the purpose of uniting. And so they would have these times where they would come together and share their points of view and listen very intelligently to each other so they could understand all the different perspectives. And I really know that's what God wants. God wants us to be careful to think our way is always right when we need to understand His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so we need to come together around that. And that's a part of what makes our church really relevant today is when we're willing to do that. Well, and I think that's a prayer of ours at Crossroads, not only in our movement as a whole, but really valuing and loving other churches, especially our local churches as well. And one of the things that I think is unique about us also is the fact that we baptize, that uh, anyone can baptize actually. Well, and that, that's probably one of the things that people get shocked at is when they come in, they almost that sometimes can't figure out who the pastors are and who they're not. And um, so for instance, when it comes to baptism, you know, we will allow whoever is the person that led that person to Christ to be the one to baptize them. And a lot of people don't get that. They think, well, shouldn't it be a pastor? Shouldn't it be, uh, some people even say a priest. But the Bible teaches something incredible. It's called the priesthood of all believers. In 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5, it says that God desires that we're all a kingdom of priests, which includes you, by the way, even as a woman or me as a man. And the reality is, is we're all called into this royal priesthood. Uh, Peter brings that up again in 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10, that we're all to be a part of the priesthood. And so when we begin to understand that, that also became a big part of our movement that we believe in the priesthood of all believers. We believe that every person is given a spiritual gift, every person is to use their spiritual gift in ministry in the church, that our jobs are to equip them to use it as in, in the way that God would want them to in the greatest way possible. And so then what happens then is we value everybody. Hmm. And so, you know, we don't have a, the hierarchy. Now we do have, you know, the idea of understanding who's leading and who's not leading. But even those who lead are to lead as servants, to boost people up, to help them grow, and to help them be all that God would want them to be. Well, another thing that I love is the fact that our DNA has positioned us in a place where we can reach a whole new generation. And it's my generation uh, that is looking for something that has stability and has heritage. And uh, Crossroads has that and so does our movement. Uh, my generation is looking for people who want to come together in peace. And uh, our movement has that as well. We're a movement of unity. And my generation is looking for an older voice, for older people who are going to come alongside us as mentors. <laughs> <laughs> who will come alongside us as mentors and take us along the path that God has for us. 
We are that kind of movement that believes everyone is valuable and we value diversity. And uh, finally, my generation is looking for people who are willing to discuss the issues that face us in an intelligent and meaningful way. And so we are a movement that begin valuing the dialogue when there are differences. And that's so true. And what really concerns me is that every church is one generation away from death. If we can't reach the next generation, then we're going to die. And we've seen that happen no matter what the church's names are, no matter what they're trying to do again and again and again. And we live at a time like no other. And what you're saying is so true. Um, in, in our church, one of the great dreams we have is to reach the next generation. And I love the fact that on Wednesday night, you know, 14 to 1600 uh, uh, young adults come together to worship God in a passionate way. And, you know, we celebrate that and we love that. And we love the vibrancy. We love the vitality. We love the creativity. And, and we want to reach out to that. But that's never going to happen if we don't embrace who we really are. Because you're right, the intelligence is something. The willingness to look at different issues. The willingness not to be so uh, uh, quick to judge or quick to point out, you know, that a position's right or wrong. Unless we're willing to point back to the Bible and bring people there. And then it seems like there's an answer. And then one thing I love about your guys' generation is this is one of the most spiritual generations we've ever seen in the United States. Mm. Gen Y wants to practice spirituality. And so they're looking for a place that has heritage, a place of stability, a place where they can get uh, the answer from even an older voice, which I think is kind of fun. And then they want to be able to understand what it means to practice spirituality. The only place that can happen is the church. Mm -hmm. And our churches in particular value all the things this next generation values. But the, what would stop us is if we cling to man-made traditions. What would stop us is if we're not willing to embrace diversity. What would stop us is we're not willing to be creative and open up to whatever God wants to do in this day and time. And it's a very God-ordained mm -hmm. thing. The wonderful thing to me, God doesn't want to violate our DNA. He wants us to flourish within it. So what I'm hoping for is as we shared today that I will understand who we are, where we've come from, we'll value our heritage, we'll value our family history, but that will never ever stop us from grabbing hold of the great and new thing that God wants us to do today. And when that happens, Casey, I think Crossroads will be effective and all the churches that are listening mm. will be effective. And that's our heart's desire.